Good morning and welcome. We are uh, in the AM session for Wednesday, June 1 2. Uh, you should have already marked off on your Omega file and your Omega record sheet the work of uh, Tuesday, June 1 1. Again, if you uh, were absent, you want to make sure you're talking uh, with Miss Laird. Now we will move into uh, Wednesday's work. Today, just to give you a review, we will be back in Red Badge of Courage starting on page 78, seven, eight, uh, and we will continue with our annotative work. We will then do a brief annotative exercise followed by a break and then to return with another My Access uh, writing uh, and then an unstoppable reading and we'll call it one more session. Let's just say it out loud, rhythms can be very useful. They allow us to know what's coming so that way we can always benchmark success. But rhythms can also create quickly ruts. That is to say, the same work over and over again becomes too repetitive and therefore boring. Our annotative work can become like this. So we're going to push you now, starting today, to do a little bit better job doing your annotation work. So in front of you, a blank sheet of paper. While we're working, you really want to be paying attention to what you're writing down. And if we feel like there's some problems here in terms of completeness, we may ask you to stay an extra five minutes during break to finish with your annotation work. So you want to make sure that you are paying close attention now to our work with Red Badge of Courage. Reminding you, upon the completion of this reading, we will then watch a video presentation backslash movie of that of this novel, okay? Miss Laird. Okay, we should be on page 78, chapter 12. I need notes. No. That was just one day. And we ended with fantasizing about being teased as a coward if he returned. Chapter 12. The column that had butted stoutly at the obstacles in the roadway was barely out of the youth's sight before he saw dark waves of men come sweeping out of the woods and down through the fields. He knew at once that the steel fibers had been washed from their hearts. They were bursting from their coats and their equipments as from entanglements. They charged down upon him like terrified buffaloes. Behind them, blue smoke curled and clouded above the treetops, and through the thickets he could sometimes see a distant pink glare. The voices of the cannon were clamoring in interminable chorus. The youth was horror-stricken. He stared in agony and amazement. He forgot that he was engaged in combating the universe. He threw aside his mental pamphlets on the philosophy of the retreated and rules for the guidance of the damned. The fight was lost. The dragons were coming with invincible strides. The army, helpless in the matted thickets and blinded by the overhanging night, was going to be swallowed. War, the red animal, war, the blood-swollen god, would have bloated fill. Within him something bad to cry out. He had the impulse to make a rallying speech, to sing a battle hymn. But he could only get his tongue to call into the air, Why, what, 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 what what's the matter? Soon he was in the midst of them. They were leaping and scampering all about him. Their blanched faces shone in the dusk. They seemed, for the most part, to be very burly men. The youth turned from one to another of them as they galloped along. His incoherent questions were lost. They were heedless of his appeals. They did not seem to see him. They sometimes gabbled insanely. One huge man was asking of the sky, Say, where the plank road? Where the plank road? It was as if he had lost a child. He wept in his pain and dismay. Presently, men were running hither and thither in all ways. The artillery, booming forward, rearward, and on the flanks, made a jumble of ideas of direction. Landmarks had vanished into the gathered gloom. 
the youth began to imagine that he had got into the center of the tremendous quarrel, and he could perceive no way out of it. From the mouths of the fleeing men came a thousand wild questions, but no one made answers. The youth, after rushing about and throwing interrogations at the heedless bands of retreating infantry, finally clutched a man by the arm. They swung around face to face. Why? Why? stammered the youth, struggling with his balking tongue. The man screamed, Let me go! Let me go! His face was livid and his eyes were rolling uncontrolled. He was heaving and panting. He still grasped his rifle, perhaps having forgotten to release his hold upon it. He tugged frantically, and the youth, being compelled to lean forward, was dragged several paces. Let me go! Let me go! Why? Why? stuttered the youth. Go well, then! bawled the man in a lurid rage. He adroitly and fiercely swung his rifle. It crushed upon the youth's head. The man ran on. The youth's fingers had turned to paste upon the other's arm. The energy was smitten from his muscles. He saw the flaming wings of lightning flash before his vision. There was a deafening rumble of thunder within his head. Suddenly his legs seemed to die. He sank writhing to the ground. He tried to arise. In his efforts against the numbing pain, he was like a man wrestling with a creature of the air. There was a sinister struggle. Sometimes he would achieve a position half erect, battle with the air for a moment, and then fall again, grabbing at the grass. His face was of a clammy pallor. Deep groans were wrenched from him. At last, with a twisting movement, he got upon his hands and knees, and from thence, like a babe trying to walk, to his feet. Pressing his hands to his temples, he went lurching over the grass. He fought an intense battle with his body. His dulled senses wished him to swoon, and he opposed them stubbornly, his mind portraying unknown dangers and mutilations if he should fall upon the field. He went tall soldier fashion. He imagined secluded spots where he could fall and be unmolested. To search for one, he strove against the tide of pain. Once he put his hand to the top of his head and timidly touched the wound. The scratching pain of the contact made him draw a long breath through his clenched teeth. His fingers were dabbled with blood. He regarded them with a fixed stare. Around him he could hear the grumble of jolted cannon as the scurrying horses were lashed toward the front. Once a young officer on a besplashed charger nearly ran him down. He turned and watched the mass of guns, men, and horses sweeping in a wide curve toward a gap in a fence. The officer was making excited motions with a gauntlet at hand. The guns followed the teams with an air of unwillingness of being dragged by the heels. Okay. Just real briefly, jot a few things down for chapter 12. One of the big things is an onslaught. A huge group of men just started running, frightening him. And they were scared, and they were asking questions. And he was almost so scared by all these men coming through that he couldn't really do anything. Some officers of the scattered infantry were cursing and railing like fishwives. Their scolding voices could be heard above the din. Into the unspeakable jumble in the roadway rode a squadron of cavalry. The faded yellow of their facings shone bravely. There was a mighty altercation. The artillery were assembling as if for a conference. 
The blue haze of evening was upon the field. The lines of forest were long purple shadows. One cloud lay along the western sky, partly smothering the red. As the youth left the scene behind him, he heard the guns suddenly roar out. He imagined them shaking in black rage. They belched and howled like brass devils guarding a gate. The soft air was filled with the tremendous remonstrance. With it came the shattering peal of opposing infantry. Turning to look behind him, he could see sheets of orange light illumine the shadowy distance. There were subtle and sudden lightnings in the far air. At times, he thought he could see heaving masses of men. He hurried on in the dusk. The day had faded until he could barely distinguish place for his feet. The purple darkness was filled with men who lectured and jabbered. Sometimes he could see them gesticulating against the blue and somber sky. There seemed to be a great ruck of men and munitions spread about in the forest and in the fields. The little narrow roadway now lay lifeless. There were overturned wagons like sun-dried boulders. The bed of the former torrent was choked with the bodies of horses and splintered parts of war machines. It had come to pass that his wound painted but little. He was afraid to move rapidly, however, for a dread of disturbing it. He held his head very still and took many precautions against stumbling. He was filled with anxiety, and his face was pinched and drawn in anticipation of the pain of any sudden mistake of his feet in the gloom. His thoughts, as he walked, fixed intently upon his hurt. There was a cool, liquid feeling about it, and he imagined blood moving slowly down under his hair. His head seemed to swell into a size that made him think his neck to be inadequate. The new silence of his wound made much worriment. The little blistering voices of pain that had called out from his scalp were, he thought, definite in their expression of danger. By then he believed he could measure his plight. But when they remained ominously silent, he became frightened and imagined terrible fingers that clutched into his brain. Okay, so he got wounded. Can anybody tell me what is his wound? How did he get hurt? The only guy that he was trying to grab. Right. Okay. So I just want to make sure everybody has that. He did get wounded. Okay. Yeah. How he got wounded. And what does this essentially give him now? What do we call it? Red dead. Courage. So now he has a war wound to prove that he was part of the battle. He was in it. Remember before when he was with all of the wounded men, he kept hiding because he was ashamed because he wasn't physically hurt, maybe psychologically. he began to reflect upon various incidents and conditions of the past. He bethought him of certain meals his mother had cooked at home, in which those dishes of which he was particularly fond had occupied prominent positions. He saw the spread table. The pine walls of the kitchen were glowing in the warm light from the stove. Too, he remembered how he and his companions used to go from the schoolhouse to the bank of a shaded pool. He saw his clothes in disorderly array upon the grass of the bank. He felt the swash of the fragrant water upon his body. The leaves of the overhanging maple rustled with melody in the wind of youthful summer. He was overcome presently by a dragging weariness. His head hung forward and his shoulders were stooped, as if he were bearing a great bundle. His feet shuffled along the ground. He held continuous arguments as to whether he should lie down and sleep at some near spot or force himself on until he reached a certain haven. He often tried to dismiss the question, but his body persisted in rebellion and his senses nagged at him like pampered babies. At last he heard a cheery voice near his shoulder. He seemed to be in a pretty bad way, boy. The youth did not look up, but he assented with thick tongue. Uh, the owner of the cheery voice took him firmly by the arm. Well, he said, 
with a round laugh. I'm going your way. The whole gang is going your way. And I guess I can give you a lift. They began to walk like a drunken man and his friend. As they went along, the man questioned the youth and assisted him with the replies like one manipulating the mind of a child. Sometimes he interjected anecdotes. What regiment do you belong to? Huh? What's that? The 304th New York? Why, what corps is that in? Oh, it is. Why, I thought they wasn't engaged today. They're way over in the center. Oh, they was, eh? Well, pretty nearly everybody got their share of fighting today. By dad, I give myself up for dead a number of times. They were shooting here and shooting there and hollering here and hollering there in the damn darkness until I couldn't tell to see my soul which side I was on. Sometimes I thought I was sure enough from a higher, <laughs> and other times I could have swore I was from the bitter end of Florida. It was the most mixed up dirt thing I ever see. And these here hall woods is a regular mess. It'll be a miracle if we find our regiments tonight. Pretty soon, though, we'll be the plenty of guards and provost guards and one thing and another. Oh, there they go with an officer, I guess. Oh, look at his hand and dragon. He's got all the war he wants, I bet. He won't be talking so big about his reputation and all when they go to saw it off his leg. Ooh, poor fella. Yeah, my brother's got whiskers just like that. Now, how did you get way over here, anyhow? Your regiment is a long way from here, ain't it? Well, I guess we can find it. Uh, you know, there was a boy killed in my company today that I thought the world and all of. Uh, Jack was a nice fella. My ginger had hurt like thunder to see old Jack just get knocked flat. We was a-standing pretty peaceful for a spell, though there was men running every way all around us. And while we was a-standing like that, along comes a big fat fella. He began to pick at Jack's elbow, and he says, Hey, where's the road to the river? And Jack, he never paid no attention, and the fella kept on a-pecking at his elbow and saying, Hey, where's the road to the river? Jack was a-looking ahead all the time, trying to see the Johnnies coming through the woods, and he never paid no attention to this big fat fella for a long time, but at last he turned around and he says, I go to hell and find the road to the river. And just then a shot slapped him bang on the side of the head. He was a sergeant too. That was his last words. Thunder, I wish we were sure of finding our regiments tonight. It's going to be a long hunting, but I guess we can do it. In the search which followed, the man of the cheery voice seemed to the youth to possess a wand of a magic kind. He threaded the mazes of the tangled forest with a strange fortune. In encounters with guards and patrols, he displayed the keenness of a detective and the valor of a gammon. Obstacles fell before him and became of assistance. The youth, with his chin still on his breast, stood woodenly by while his companion beat ways and means out of sullen things. The forest seemed a vast hive of men buzzing about in frantic circles, but the cheery man conducted the youth without mistakes until at last he began to chuckle with glee and self-satisfaction. <laughs> there you are. See that fire? The youth nodded stupidly. Well, there's where your regiment is. And now goodbye, old boy. Good luck to you. A warm and strong hand clasped the youth's languid fingers for an instant. And then he heard a cheerful and audacious whistling as the man strode away. As he who had so befriended him was thus passing out of his life, it suddenly occurred to the youth that he had not once seen his face. So now what happened? Everything that he's been worrying about in his head, running away from the battle, his regiment making fun of him, this guy just took him right back without a thought. So. Write down a few things of what you anticipate might happen. You might want to mention that he got help back to his regiment. Just remember, we're going to look over your group, your notes before break. And if you haven't been writing down much every time you take a break, it will take a little bit more time to fix that. Page 85, chapter 13. Chapter 13. The youth went slowly toward the fire indicated by his departed friend. As he reeled, he bethought him of the welcome his comrades would give him. He had a conviction that he would soon feel in his sore heart the barbed missiles of ridicule. 
He had no strength to invent a tale. He would be a soft target. He made vague plans to go off into the deeper darkness and hide, but they were all destroyed by the voices of exhaustion and pain from his body. His ailments clamoring forced him to seek the place of food and rest at whatever cost. He swung unsteadily toward the fire. He could see the forms of men throwing black shadows in the red light, and as he went near it became known to him in some way that the ground was strewn with sleeping men. Of a sudden he confronted a black and monstrous figure. A rifle barrel caught some glinting beams. Halt! Halt! He was dismayed for a moment, but he presently thought that he recognized the nervous voice. As he stood, tottering before the rifle barrel, he called out, I... Hello, Wilson. You... You here? The rifle was lowered to a position of caution, and the loud soldier came slowly forward. He peered into the youth's face. Is that you, Henry? Yes, it's... It's me. Well... Well, old boy, said the other. By Ginger, I'm glad to see you. I give you up for a goner. I thought you was dead, sure enough. There was husky emotion in his voice. The youth found that now he could barely stand upon his feet. There was a sudden sinking of his forces. He thought he must hasten to produce his tail to protect him from the missiles already on the lips of his redoubtable comrades. So, staggering before the loud soldier, he began... Yes, yes, I, I, I've had an awful time. I've been all over, way over on the right. Terrible fighting over there. I, I had an awful time. I got separated from the regiment. Over on the right, I, I got shot in the head. I never see such fighting. Awful time. I don't see how I could have got separated from the regiment. I got shot too. His friend had stepped forward quickly. What? Got shot? Why didn't you say so first? Poor old boy, we must... Hold on a minute. What am I doing? I'll call Simpson. Another figure at that moment loomed in the gloom. They could see that it was the corporal. Who are you talking to, Wilson? He demanded. His voice was anger-toned. Who are you talking to? Oh, you're the dirt sentinel. What? Hello, Henry. You here? Well, I thought you was dead four hours ago. Great Jerusalem, they keep turning up every ten minutes or so. We thought we'd lost 42 men by straight count, but if they keep on coming this way, we'll get the company all back by morning yet. Where was you? Over on the right. I got separated, began the youth with considerable glibness. But his friend had interrupted hastily. Yes, and he got shot in the head and he's in a fix and we must see to him right away. He rested his rifle in the hollow of his left arm and his right around the youth's shoulder. She must hurt like thunder, he said. So do you guys think Henry's going to be milking this for all he's worth? Trying to get some sympathy? Yeah. Is this what you predicted that he was going to do? I said the regiment would take him back up. Maybe questions. All right. So you might want to jot down the big lie he's already told to the very first person he sees. He got funny separated. How, I think he it's funny shot. how he comes up with a lie like that. Well, and he's been thinking about what he was going to tell the regiment if he had not really had to go back, right? Okay, we're on page 87. The youth leaned heavily upon his friend. Yes, it hurts. It hurts a good deal, he replied. There was a faltering in his voice. Oh, said the corporal. He linked his arm in the youth's and drew him forward. Come on, Henry, I'll take care of you. As they went on together, the loud private called out after them. Put me asleep in my blanket, Simpson. Now, hold on a minute. Here's my canteen. It's full of coffee. Now, look at his head by the fire and see how it looks. Maybe it's a pretty bad one. When I get relieved in a couple of minutes, I'll be over and see to him. The youth's senses were so deadened that his friend's voice sounded from afar and he could scarcely feel the pressure of the corporal's arm. He submitted passively to the latter's directing strength. His head was in the old manner hanging forward upon his breast. His knees wobbled. The corporal led him into the glare of the fire. 
No, Henry, he said. Let's have a look at your old head. The youth sat obediently, and the corporal, laying aside his rifle, began to fumble in the bushy hair of his comrade. He was obliged to turn the other's head so that the full flush of the firelight would beam upon it. He puckered his mouth with a critical air. He drew back his lips and whistled through his teeth when his fingers came in contact with the splashed blood and the rare wound. Ah, oh, here we are, he said. He awkwardly made further investigations. Just as I thought, he added presently. You've been grazed by a ball. It's raised a queer lump, just as if some feller had lambed you on the head with a club. <laughs> you stopped a bleeding a long time ago. And the most about it is that in the morning you'll feel that a number 10 hat wouldn't fit you. Yeah, and your head'll be all head up and feel as dry as burnt pork. And you may get a lot of other sicknesses too by morning. Yeah, you can't never tell. Still, I don't much think so. It's just a damn good belt on the head and nothing more. Now, you just sit here and don't move while I go right out the relief. Then I'll send Wilson to take care of you. The corporal went away. The youth remained on the ground like a parcel. <coughs> he stared with a vacant look into the fire. After a time, he aroused for some part, and the things about him began to take form. He saw that the ground in the deep shadows was cluttered with men, sprawling in every conceivable posture. Glancing narrowly into the more distant darkness, he caught occasional glimpses of visages that loomed pallid and ghostly, lit with a phosphorescent glow. These faces expressed in their lines the deep stupor of the tired soldiers. They made them appear like men drunk with wine. This bit of forest might have appeared to an ethereal wanderer as a scene of the result of some frightful debauch. On the other side of the fire, the youth observed an officer asleep, seated bolt upright with his back against a tree. There was something perilous in his position. Badgered by dreams, perhaps, he swayed with little bounces and starts, like an old, toddy-stricken grandfather in a chimney corner. Dust and stains were upon his face. His lower jaw hung down as if lacking strength to assume its normal position. He was the picture of an exhausted soldier after a feast of war. He had evidently gone to sleep with his sword in his arms. These two had slumbered in an embrace, but the weapon had been allowed in time to fall unheeded to the ground. The brass-mounted hilt lay in contact with some parts of the fire. Within the gleam of rose and orange light from the burning sticks were other soldiers, snoring and heaving, or lying death-like in slumber. A few pairs of legs were stuck forth, rigid and straight. The shoes displayed the mud or dust of marches, and bits of rounded trousers protruding from the blankets showed rents and tears from hurried pitchings through the dense brambles. The fire cackled musically. From it swelled light smoke. Overhead the foliage moved softly. The leaves, with their faces turned toward the blaze, were colored, shifting hues of silver, often edged with red. Far off to the right, through a window in the forest, could be seen a handful of stars lying like glittering pebbles on the black level of the night. Occasionally, in this low-arched hall, a soldier would arouse and turn his body to a new position, the experience of his sleep having taught him of uneven and objectionable places upon the ground under him. Or perhaps he would lift himself to a sitting posture, blink at the fire for an unintelligent moment, throw a swift glance at his prostrate companion, and then cuddle down again with a grunt of sleepy content. The youth sat in a forlorn heap until his friend, the loud young soldier, came, swinging two canteens by their light strings. Well, now, Henry, old boy, said the latter, we'll have it fixed up in just about a minute. He had the bustling ways of an amateur nurse. He fussed around the fire and stirred the sticks to brilliant exertions. He made his patient drink largely from the canteen that contained the coffee. It was, to the youth, a delicious draught. He tilted his head afar he tilted his head afar back and held the canteen long to his lips. The 
cool mixture went caressingly down his blistered throat. Having finished, he sighed with comfortable delight. The loud young soldier watched his comrade with an air of satisfaction. He later produced an extensive handkerchief from his pocket. He folded it into a manner of bandage and soused water from the other canteen upon the middle of it. This crude arrangement he bound over the youth's head, tying the ends in a queer knot at the back of the neck. There, he said, moving off and surveying his deed. You look like the devil, but I bet you feel better. The youth contemplated his friend with grateful eyes. Upon his aching and swelling head, the cold cloth was like a tender woman's hand. Yeah, you don't hardly to say nothing, remarked his friend approvingly. I know I'm a blacksmith at taking care of sick folks, and you never squeaked. Ah, you're a good one, Henry. Most men would have been in the hospital long ago. Shot in the head ain't fooling business. The youth made no reply, but began to fumble with the buttons of his jacket. Well, come now, continued his friend. Come on, I must put you to bed and see that you get a good night's nice rest. The other got carefully erect, and the loud young soldier led him among the sleeping forms lying in groups and rows. Presently he stooped and picked up his blankets. He spread the rubber one upon the ground and placed the woolen one about the youth's shoulders. There now, he said. Lie down and get some sleep. The youth, with his manner of dog-like obedience, got carefully down like a crone stooping. He stretched out with a murmur of relief and comfort. The ground felt like the softest couch. But of a sudden, he ejaculated, oh, Hold on a minute. Where are you going to sleep? His friend waved his hand impatiently. Right down there by you. Oh, oh, hold on a minute continued the youth. What you gonna sleep in? I've got your... The loud young soldier snarled. Shut up and go on to sleep. Don't be making a damn fool of yourself, he said severely. After the reproof, the youth said no more. An exquisite drowsiness had spread through him. The warm comfort of the blanket enveloped him and made a gentle languor. His head fell forward on his crooked arm, and his weighted lids went softly down over his eyes. Hearing a splatter of musketry from the distance, he wondered indifferently if those men sometimes slept. He gave a long sigh, snuggled down into his blanket, and in a moment was like his comrades. Okay, go ahead and finish up chapter 13. What did he observe about the regiment as he was sitting there looking around? They're all pretty exhausted. Then make sure you write down who's been taking care of them. Chapter 14. When the youth awoke, it seemed to him that he had been asleep for a thousand years, and he felt sure that he opened his eyes upon an unexpected world. Gray mists were slowly shifting before the first efforts of the sun rays. An impending splendor could be seen in the eastern sky. An icy dew had chilled his face, and immediately upon arousing, he curled farther down into his blanket. He stared for a while at the leaves overhead, moving in a heraldic wind of the day. The distance was splintering and blaring with the noise of fighting. There was, in the sound, an expression of a deadly persistency, as if it had not begun and was not to cease. About him were the rows and groups of men that he had dimly seen the previous night. They were getting a last draught of sleep before the awakening. 
The gaunt, careworn features and dusty figures were made plain by this quaint light at the dawning, but it dressed the skin of the men in corpse-like hues and made the tangled limbs appear pulseless and dead. The youth started up with a little cry when his eyes first swept over this motionless mass of men, thick spread upon the ground, pallid and in strange postures. His disordered mind interpreted the hall of the forest as a charnel place. He believed for an instant that he was in the house of the dead, and he did not dare to move, lest these corpses start up, squalling and squawking. In a second, however, he achieved his proper mind. He swore a complicated oath at himself. He saw that this somber picture was not a fact of the present, but a mere prophecy. He heard then the noise of a fire crackling briskly in the cold air, and turning his head, he saw his friend pottering busily about a small blaze. A few other figures moved in the fog, and he heard the hard cracking of axe blows. Suddenly there was a hollow rumble of drums, a distant bugle sang faintly. Similar sounds, varying in strength, came from near and far over the forest. The bugles called to each other like brazen gamecocks. The near thunder of the regimental drums rolled. The body of men in the woods rustled. There was a general uplifting of heads. A murmuring of voices broke upon the air. In it, there was much bass of grumbling oaths. Strange gods were addressed in condemnation of the early hours necessary to correct war. An officer's peremptory tenor rang out and quickened the stiffened movement of the men. The tangled limbs unraveled. The corpse-hued faces were hidden behind fists that twisted slowly in the eye sockets. The youth sat up and gave vent to an enormous yawn. Thunder, he remarked petulantly. He rubbed his eyes, and then putting up his hand, felt carefully the bandage over his wound. His friend, perceiving him to be awake, came from the fire. Oh, well, Henry, old man, how do you feel this morning? he demanded. The youth yawned again. Then he puckered his mouth to a little pucker. His head, in truth, felt precisely like a melon, and there was an unpleasant sensation at his stomach. Oh, Lord, I feel pretty bad, he said. Thunder, exclaimed the other. I hoped you'd feel all right this morning. Let's see the bandage. I guess it slipped. He began to tinker at the wound in rather a clumsy way until the youth exploded. Gosh darn it, he said in sharp irritation. You're the hangest man I ever saw. You wear muffs on your hands. Why in good thunderation can't you be more easy? I'd rather you stand off and throw guns at it. Now go slow and don't act as if you was nailing down carpet. He glared with insolent command at his friend, but the latter answered soothingly. Well, I'll come now and get some grub, he said. Then maybe you'll feel better. At the fireside, the loud young soldier watched over his comrade's wants with tenderness and care. He was very busy marshalling the little black vagabonds of tin cups and pouring into them a streaming iron-colored mixture from a small and sooty tin pail. He had some fresh meat which he roasted hurriedly on a stick. He sat down then and contemplated the youth's appetite with glee. The youth took note of a remarkable change in his comrade since those days of camp life upon the riverbank. He seemed no more to be continually regarding the proportions of his personal prowess. He was not furious at small words that pricked his conceits. He was no more a loud young soldier. There was about him now a fine reliance. He showed a quiet belief in his purposes and his abilities, and this inward confidence evidently enabled him to be indifferent to little words of other men aimed at him. The youth reflected. He had been used to regarding his comrade as a blatant child with an audacity grown from his inexperience, thoughtless, headstrong, jealous, and filled with a tinsel courage a swaggering babe accustomed to strut in his own dooryard. The youth wondered where had been born these new eyes, when his comrade had made the great discovery that there were many men who would refuse to be subjected by him. Apparently the other had now climbed a peak of wisdom from which he could perceive himself as a very wee thing. And the youth saw that ever after it would be easier to live in his friend's neighborhood. 
His comrade balanced his ebony coffee cup on his knee. Well, Henry, he said. Why don't you guys go ahead and write down how Henry's acting? Why do you think Wilson has changed? What do you think the chances are? Do you think we'll wallop him? The youth considered for a moment. The day before yesterday, he finally replied with coldness, he would have bet you'd lick the whole kitten boodle all by yourself. His friend looked a trifle amazed. Would I? He asked. He pondered. Huh. Perhaps I would, he decided at last. He stared humbly at the fire. The youth was quite disconcerted at this surprising reception of his remarks. I oh, know you wouldn't either, he said, hastily trying to retrace. But the other made a deprecating gesture. Oh, you need a mind, Henry, he said. I believe I was a pretty big fool in those days. He spoke as after a lapse of years. There was a little pause. Well, the officers say we've got the reps in a pretty tight box, said the friend clearing his throat in a commonplace way. They all seem to think we've got them just where we want them. I don't know about that, the youth replied. What I seen over on the right makes me think it was the other way about. From where I was, it looked as if we was getting a good pounding yesterday. Do you think so? inquired the friend. I thought we handled them pretty rough yesterday. Not a bit, said the youth. Why, Lord, man, you didn't see nothing of the fight. Why... Then a sudden thought came to him. Oh, Jim Conklin's dad. His friend started. What, is he? Jim Conklin? The youth spoke slowly. Yes, he's dead. Shot in the side. You don't say so. Jim Conklin. Poor cuss. All about them were other small fires surrounded by men with their little black utensils. From one of these near came seven sharp voices in a row. It appeared that two light-footed soldiers had been teasing a huge bearded man, causing him to spill coffee upon his blue knees. The man had gone into a rage and had sworn comprehensively. Stung by his language, his tormentors had immediately bristled at him with a great show of resenting unjust oaths. Possibly there was going to be a fight. The friend arose and went over to them, making pacific motions with his arms. Ah, oh, here now, boys, what's the use? He said. We'll be at the reps in less than an hour. It was a good fight among ourselves. One of the light-footed soldiers turned upon him, red-faced and violent. You need to come around here with your preaching. I suppose you don't approve of fighting since Charlie Morgan licked you. But I don't see what business this here is of yours or anybody else. Well, it ain't, said the friend mildly. Still, I hate to see. There was a tangled argument. Well, he said the two, indicating their opponent with accusative forefingers. The huge soldier was quite purple with rage. He pointed at the two soldiers with his great hand, extended claw-like. Well, hey! But during this argumentative time, the desire to deal blows seemed to pass, although they said much to each other. Finally, the friend returned to his old seat. In a short while, the three antagonists could be seen together in an amiable bunch. Uh, Jimmy Rogers says I'll have to fight him after the battle today, announced the friend as he again seated himself. He says he don't allow no interfering in his business. I hate to see the boys fight among themselves. The youth laughed. You changed a good bit. He ain't at all like you was. I remember when you and that Irish fella... He stopped and laughed again. No, oh, I didn't used to be that way, said his friend thoughtfully. 
That's true enough. Well, oh, I didn't mean... began the youth. The friend made another deprecatory gesture. Oh, you needn't mind, Henry. There was another little pause. The regiment lost over half the men yesterday, remarked the friend eventually. I thought, of course, they was all dead, but lost. They kept a coming back last night until it seems, after all, we didn't lose but a few. They've been scattered all over, wandering around in the woods, fighting with other regiments and everything. Just like you done. So, said the youth. Chapter 14, go ahead and write down a few lines. What do you think is significant about half the regiment being gone and most of them wandering back in? Do you think that they ran like Henry? Were they really fighting with other regiments? Let's see if we can get through chapter 15 before we're done. We're on page 97. Chapter 15. The regiment was standing at order arms at the side of a lane, waiting for the command to march, when suddenly the youth remembered the little packet and wrapped in a faded yellow envelope, which the loud young soldier with lugubrious words had entrusted to him. It made him start. He uttered an exclamation and turned toward his comrade. Wilson? What? His friend, at his side in the ranks, was thoughtfully staring down the road. From some cause, his expression was at that moment very meek. The youth, regarding him with sidelong glances, felt impelled to change his purpose. Oh, nothing, he said. His friend turned his head in some surprise. Why, well, what was he going to say? Oh, nothing, repeated the youth. He resolved not to deal the little blow. It was sufficient that the fact made him glad. It was not necessary to knock his...